Good morning, Northport. Welcome to Northport Community United Church of Christ. No matter where you are or who you are in life's journey, you're always welcome here. And I do mean that, you're always welcome here. If you have a cell phone, would you mind at least silencing it or turning it off because the message we have is more important. Uh, the Red Fellowship books, if you could sign them and pass them on and then pass them back. I'd like to welcome Ty Morgan from the Cornerstone Hope in Ohio, who provided grief seminar yesterday. We'll bring you the message this morning. Welcome, Ty, from good old Ohio, where it's nice and cold. The church office will be closed tomorrow, in observance of Martin Luther King Day. And uh, please check your bulletin for dates and times for activities this week. Sign up for the church directory photos will be out again today in the narthex. We want everyone to be included, members and friends. Make sure you check the flyer in your bulletin about the movie on January 28th and it's going to be it's going to be good. Do we have any announcements? I just want to say a quick word in thanking everybody for the wonderful response and words that we have been given for the decorations for this Christmas season. Sadly, it comes down today. Next week, it's going to look pretty bare in here. But I also want everyone to know I may have had a vision, but it was not me alone that did this. Everyone that had an opportunity or gave their time in helping to set this up, would you please stand and let everyone know that there's quite a few of us here that have done this. Thank you to all. Good morning. I'm Lorraine Woolen. This is Arlene Hughes, and together with Terry Hong and Maggie Palmer, we represent the UCC Women's Group Fashion Show Committee. We're currently planning our annual fashion show and luncheon fundraiser. This is our leading fundraising event, and it will be held on Thursday, February the 16th. Last year, we raised $2,400, which we used to benefit the lives of others, both globally and locally, through donations to organizations such as Habitat for Humanity and Northport Social Services. Our event committee knows that different programs and activities in the church regularly ask for your support, your time, your talents, and your money. And we understand that each person can only do or give so much. But we hope that once again, you may be able to assist us in making this important fundraiser a success. Arlene has some thoughts and ideas that may allow individual support by working together and how even a small contribution has great value. We have already found out what my name is, it's Arlene. And <clears throat> as a member of the Ladies Fellowship Group and on the Fundraising Fashion Show Committee, this is the fifth year. And again, we're once, we're once again here to ask for your help. Items are needed for the raffle and for the silent auction tables. Individual items as well as baskets are most welcome to create interest and to generate more fun for the ladies while they shop the tables before lunch. They always have fun just looking at everything. I created a couple of ideas with items from my home. Uh, the first one is on a golfing basket. So this one contains um, mini golf pillow. It has a couple of sleeves of golf balls, first aid kit, ladies visor, uh, golf edition book, uh, seashell chocolates. Value of this is about $30 if I was buying everything retail plus the cost of the basket. This will be a raffle item. Uh, as a suggestion, I mean, we may or may not add just these particular items. We may change them if, if other donations come in. Another one. <clears throat> We've had a donation from Louis Bike Shop. Thank you, Norma, for getting this for us. And uh, this is a bicycle um, basket. And in it are a number of items such as um, sunscreen, uh, tissues, a ball cap, um, a, a, a drink cup, 
value on this one is about $35. Again, this could be a raffle item if there were more expensive items in it. Just a, just a few things, the suggestions that we can do. Ideas for baskets, well, Greek, be fun to make a Greek basket up, Italian, maybe baking supplies or cleaning supplies, and gift cards from any place that you, can, that you re frequent. <clears throat> it isn't necessary to create an entire basket. If you'd like to make a donation toward the creation of one, or as an individual item, which I, which I also have, there's an individual item that may just stand up by itself. Um, just bring them in to, to me or to Terry or to uh, Lorraine. Maggie will be back next week. Next Sunday will be in, uh, I will be in the narthex to, um, so that you, and, and hold them over into the coffee hour. I've got lots of baskets back there for you to take a look, a look at. And all baskets and other items donated, we are asking to be in no later than February the 12th. Earlier would be better. But we've got to create the baskets if we, if we need to, to wrap them and have them ready for the, um, for the show. And it's only going to take us, a, <laughs> take us a couple of days to do that. Thank you very much. And don't forget, this is your little reminder in the bulletin today. Thank you. Is there any other announcements? Tea party announcements, that's, that's just what's happening. Do we have any first time visitors? Could I see a show of hands? We got one right there. Very good. Where are you from? Okay, it's cold up there too, isn't it? It's cold everywhere but here. Another one back here. Vermont. <laughs> it's cold ever. It's even cold down here. <laughs> For us people who live here year-round, it's very cold. Let us be at worship. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. The scripture for this Sunday is on the top of your bulletin there on the first page, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, and I like how simply and to the point it uh, 
uh, brings it near to us. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. We welcome you to our worship service, and I'm just going to say what uh, Brenda Vance says every time she has an announcement. She says, good morning, church family. <laughs> I like that. That's, that's a great way to greet each other. Um, today, we are going to have a special piece that the choir is going to uh, sing for us. But as you know, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, Martin Luther King was an American Baptist minister an activist who was a leader in the civil rights movement. He's best known for his role in the advancement of civil rights using nonviolent civil disobedience, and here it is, based on his Christian faith. And I'm going to share um, part of his speech that we are so familiar with, um, entitled, I Have a Dream. I say to you today, my friends, though even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, uh, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. And this is the last part. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. Isn't that amazing um, that we have people uh, like Martin Luther King Jr., um, in the history of this nation who were brave enough, who had a heart filled with faith, um, who were determined enough to have a dream, to be brave enough to have a dream, right? And to pursue it. And uh, individuals like Rosa Parks and others. So today we honor their memory. Uh, and again, uh, Martin Luther King was born January 15, 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia and he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee. Let us stand together today, and we're going to sing our opening hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God.
Good morning. There's nothing like hitting the road when you deplane. Last Sunday we deplaned in Fort Myers at 9 o'clock at night. On Wednesday night we were having dinner with the Tallmans. On Thursday morning I was at the men's club in, Park, in Holiday Park. Thursday night we went to the band concert and here I am, lay reader, first Sunday in church. <laughs> And people, my friends up north say, what do you do all winter long down there? <laughs> Would you please rise and join me in the litany of praise and approach? <clears throat> like the disciples, we are called to be God's servants. To serve others, to tell the good news of God's love. Paul tells us we are called to be saints. We are called to be a light. To show with our actions the love of our God. As God's servants, saints, and light, let, let us, us worship, worship God. God. Martin Luther King created his own eulogy. The sermon is dubbed the drum major sermon. And I'd like to read you a few lines of that because it's relevant to the song that we're singing this morning. If any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. Tell them not to mention I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for someone to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right and to walk with them. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe the naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were prison. And I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace, that I was a drum major for righteousness. All the other shallow things shall not matter. I just want to leave a committed life behind, and that is all I want to say. And he goes on from his favorite song. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a well song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain.
loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so little ones who them belong they are weak but he is strong that we talked about before. And I know one person remembers. She must have a great memory. You're studying 
right now about Martin Luther King Jr., right? Got that in school? Did anybody say Martin Luther King Jr.? And before we talked about Martin Luther, and Madeline remembers everything I say. She's <laughs> a wonder. And we also have little boxes. Did anybody lose their little box? The, it's our thank you box. If you lose your thank you box, everybody's got a thing. Is there anything in it? <laughs> really? All right. OK. What we do put in it is our thank yous to God. When we go outside and we hear a bird singing, isn't that wonderful? You live here in the US. It's a wonderful place for a kid to grow up, let me tell you. There are other places where kids go outside and the last thing they're thinking about is listening to a bird sing. They're thinking about maybe breakfast, dinner, anything that they can get. So we have another thank you. Thank you, God. Write it down, put it in your box, okay? Today we're gonna to talk about saying a prayer. How many said a prayer this morning? Well, I know you guys did. You said a prayer this morning. And I'm going to tell you a little prayer that you can say every morning when you wake up before you go to class, okay? Before you get dressed and go to school, here's a little prayer that you can say, all right? Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And then you take off for the day, your heart is opened, Jesus is watching over you all the time, whether you say the prayer or not, but he's in your heart. And that could help some behavior for the rest of the day, if you remember Maybe I shouldn't say that word. Jesus is in my heart. Okay? This is our time for celebrations and concerns. And I already told you that uh, Brenda made this birthday hat. <laughs> and uh, last week we had somebody who was wearing it practically the entire service. <laughs> so are we celebrating any birthdays today? Oh, Patty? <laughs> and it's your birthday? Wednesday, okay. Happy birthday, and uh, I pray that you have a wonderful birthday with your family. And, uh, you know, I just want you to know that uh, it's been such a, a joy to work together with Patty. She is a, an excellent office manager and such a blessing to this church, and so is her family. Happy birthday. Oh, well, not everybody might pass. Here's your chance. <laughs> Anybody else celebrating a birthday? Okay. Well, uh, then let's sing happy birthday to, uh, well, wait, any, any anniversaries? Yes. Andrea. We have a celebration we'd like to share with this church. 
we were married on December 23rd. So we've been married for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> And we were married in a church, so it was a, it was a holy union, and we we're very pleased about that. Also, I'd like to thank this great guy, because I'm standing here this morning after major foot surgery four days after our marriage. He's a great guy. <laughs> and thanks to the prayers that we have from our friends here in the church for my healing. So it's going real fast, and we want to especially thank this terrific pastor for his warm card to us during that time. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we're glad to have you. And uh, um, so we're going to sing uh, any other anniversaries. We don't want to leave anybody out. Okay, then we're going to sing happy birthday and happy anniversary. So uh, why don't you give me a show of, or us, a show of hands if you just came back from up north, real high, so we can see who, who all they are right there. Welcome, welcome. It's so good to have you back, and uh, we missed you, and it's wonderful to have you back and be part of our worship today. Uh, we're praying for families that have experienced loss, so we are uplift, uplifting Karen uh, Knudsen, uh, her husband, uh, Philip uh, passed away very unexpectedly last Sunday, early morning hours. And Karen, I just want you to know we, we are here for you, and uh, we're sorry for your loss, and, and pray for you during this time and your family. We pray for the Beach family, um, the Bush family, and then also Robert um, um, for you, as I know you lost your mom. So uh, we pray for... Um, all those that have experienced loss. Lord God, we turn to you today, and we just uh, thank you that you are truly the God who has all the resources that are needed to see every individual and every family member through their uh, loss um, and their time of loss. We pray for your presence, for your light, for your peace to make all the difference, and we ask this humbly in Jesus' name. We thank you for those that have returned from up north and that they're safely here in our midst again. And um, we worship you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Um, also prayers for our friend Diane Larnack, who found fell off a ladder uh, last Tuesday and actually died Thursday night. And so it's really sad for them, and uh, they just live in Lansport now. And we, we want you and that family and to have staff there. Yes. Um, so we're praying for the Moriano family right now, Lord. You know all the circumstances, every situation, every little uh, detail of that uh, heartache and the big things, the small things, every worry, every pain, and every tear that they cry. And we pray that you surround them with your care and your love this very moment and in the many moments that will follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Little girl, six pounds, six ounces. Mother and daughter are doing very well, and the father seems to have survived, too. Well, that's very encouraging. <laughs> Congratulations. I want to celebrate the birth of my third great-grandchild, Caleb Ingle. He weighed eight pounds and 11 ounces last week, Friday. I believe he's doing well from pictures I see, and my family keeps growing. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Wonderful, wonderful news. We love to hear stuff like that. That's great. Any other prayer requests this morning? Yes, Mary Alice. Yes. 
Oh, wow. He's uh, due to hopefully begin the new therapy uh, this week, uh, and he needs prayers. Max, this is Amy. Yes. Lord God, we pray for Max right now. We know that you see him. You know what his needs are. And we pray that the poison out of his body would be removed, um, that he would be healed from cancer. And we um, just entrust that whole situation and lay it into your hands. And we pray it in Jesus' name. I have to share something with you before we go on with the prayer request. That um, was an extremely humbling experience that I had this uh, past week. Somebody asked me uh, at the German service to call an individual up and pray with them because they were going through also uh, uh, cancer treatments. And so I, I did receive the phone number and I called up and uh, I talked to the husband first and then uh, he said, you know, uh, I put my wife on the phone so you can pray with her. And um, I said, um, is that okay if we pray together over the phone? Isn't it great that we can pray over the phone? It doesn't have to be in church. It can be over the phone. Uh, we can even send uh, a prayer on a voicemail and hang up and bless the person who's going to listen to it later. But anyway, I, I um, offered the prayer, and you know, she said, Pastor, just wait a moment. I'm going to put the phone down so I can fold my hands. That sentence blessed me so much. You know why? Because it showed me the condition and the position that her heart was in, right? She said, this is important, God. I want to concentrate on what you have for me. And, um, you know, that's, um, I, I love that part. And then DJ gets up today and she's talking about prayer, you know? So when we pray to God, um, everything that he gives us is unmerited favor. We haven't earned it. It's a gift. And this lady making that statement, let me fold my hands, let me get ready uh, to be in that posture of humility and prayer, is what God's looking for. And so I just, um, that really blessed me, and I hope it blessed you. Any other prayer requests? Go ahead. Prayer for uh, an old friend of ours that's struggling with a very nasty form of influenza. Uh, Katharina Lazarina Valentino Dravkov and Lazarina currently struggling with stage four lupus. Okay, wow. Uh, a lot of needs in that family. Lord God, we just pray for every name that's been called out, um, that you undertake and that you place your hand of healing upon them uh, from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet, um, that every cell would function as it should um, and that they would be healed, uh, whether that be influenza or cancer. And there are many in our midst right now who know of someone who is needing healing in their physical body. And in faith, we turn to you and ask you uh, to perform that healing. Um, and we know it's unmerited. Um, we, we humble ourselves before you and we just ask you, Lord, um, to, to bring healing to all those that are sick in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Pauline. Lord, we pray for Pauline. We pray that you draw out that pain out of her physical body, that you give her strength and peace and endurance and lots of families and friends that would surround her with encouraging words, Lord. We just pray for that right now, that people would call her today and encourage her and pray with her. And we pray for that date of that surgery to be even moved up and that she would be um, operated on much sooner than anticipated or planned for. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Oh, wow. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Let's give him a hand here. That's great. <laughs> and the C-section date is your mom's birthday. Oh. Dolly's. Okay. 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 Wow. That's even a double gift then or a four times, right? That's great. Any, any other prayer requests or joys that you have? 
Yes, good. Okay. Um, I just want to ask for prayers as Tony goes into surgery tomorrow morning. Um, just please uplift him and may the Lord's hands come down upon him, keep him safe, and have him go through some healing. Okay. Well, um, let's reach out towards Tony. He's sitting right here in that blue shirt. Uh, reach your hand toward him, and we're going to pray for, for him. Lord, we thank you that we can uplift him in prayer, and we pray that as he's going in for surgery, that you just take any apprehension or even nervousness out of his heart, give him your peace, and we pray for doctors and nurses to do just a job of excellence and that he would be healed swiftly in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Any unspoken requests? Uh, hold your hand up high. That means you cannot talk about it in public. It's too personal, but God knows what's behind that raised hand. Lord, we thank you that you read us like a book and that you are familiar with all our needs. And um, we pray that every person that has raised their hands, and maybe even the ones that uh, didn't, but it's in their heart. The need is there. We know that uh, you have uh, all the promises and all the resources and all the solutions um, uh, to every problem that we have. You have more solutions. And we pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, at this time, we're going to bring our tithes and offerings. And, um, and then we're going to sing a hymn. And then we're going to welcome uh, Ty uh, as he's going to share the word with us today. to the 
uh, promises that you have for us, for all the provisions that flow into our lives. We do not take them for granted. We say thank you, and we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus Christ and His Righteousness. Uh, uh, Ty Morgan. He is the spiritual care coordinator and counselor for Cornerstone of Hope in Independence, Ohio, and he is going to speak the word to us today. Um, so uh, let's give him a warm welcome. Ty Morgan. Good morning. Good morning. Sounds like this thing is on. I am very blessed and honored and privileged to be here this morning. It has been a wonderful uh, time of fellowship and ministry uh, this past weekend uh, with, with your family and uh, certainly with Attila. And I am honored that God would choose to minister the way that he does in my presence and if like that song that was sung earlier if God can help someone through anything that I say I am I am just honored and blessed and privileged so that is my prayer for my time as I share with you this morning that God shares something with you that you need to hear an encouragement a word from the Lord and I anticipate that because he is faithful he is gracious he is merciful and he wants nothing more than for all of us to experience him in a way that we are transformed more into the likeness of Christ. I am dreading a little bit going home. There is going to be a 40 to 50 degree difference when I step <laughs> off of the plane. So not only am I dreading leaving the wonderful ministry that he is doing here, um, I, I have my coat in my bag and I will have to put that on the, the moment that I step off, but um, to be in the midst of God's people and your family, I, I am blessed and I look forward to what he's going to do in these next few moments. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you? that I am going where there is a I'm I'm going there to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and, I, and have seen him. That comes towards the end of Jesus' ministry. The men that he is speaking to have spent many days with him. And they have learned from him many things about God. And in that statement, they learn a few more things about God. Jesus is proclaiming a few important things for us today to focus on as he makes the statement that I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus makes the statement, I am the way, he is saying to us boldly and proclaiming that to find God, you find him through me. That because of God's love, he has sent me to show you all that there is no barrier anymore. That God is available. And by saying that I am the truth, Jesus speaking that I am the truth, reveals to us God's character. If you want to know who God is, you study the life of Jesus, and we can see the profound love of God in the way that Jesus lived and the way that he ministered. We can see the supreme authority in God in the way that Jesus moved about the world. And when he encountered evil, he simply spoke and the evil was forced to retreat. We can learn so much about our great God just looking into the life and ministry of Jesus. And Jesus proclaimed that being that I am the truth. And then that statement, the life, the opposite of life being death. The only way for us to find life is to experience and to know God and to accept His Son Jesus as our Savior. And Jesus saying, I am the life, tells us that through me, we can have fullness and abundance and joy and peace and fulfillment. And I think all of us want that today. More than anything, we as humans are on a journey of finding purpose and fulfillment. And if we don't have it, we are at a loss. We are experiencing a life less than the one that we were created to live. And in us is a deep yearning for more. And I think if all of us were honest, we have yet to reach the full fulfillment that God speaks about because it is only going to be achieved in heaven. But yet, we are to strive and to yearn here to experience life to the full that Jesus promised us. And if I could sum those three words up, I would sum them up with one word, and that would be hope. That even though we have a deep yearning inside of us, we have hope. That even though we look around this world and we see that all is not as it should be, you can turn the news on every day, you can talk to your friends and your family, you can just observe what's going on around you and you know that this world is not all that it should be. But there is hope. There is profound hope. And that is in Jesus. That is in God. That is in our Maker and Creator. And I am proud to know Him today. I am proud to say that I have had an amazing encounters with this individual person named Jesus, with his Father, who is God, and with the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you a little bit about that today. As I talk about hope, I, I thought to myself, God has given me a story, and as he adds to that story, I regularly hear him telling me that I am to share it. Your story, your story of transformation, the story of grace that in, is in your life is not something for you to hoard up and to keep and just share with intimate friends or family. It is for you to share and to proclaim. And so I'm going to do just a little bit of that today as I talk to you about hope and the way, the truth, and the life. You see on the screen up there, Yahshua. Yahshua. And as many of you know, in Hebrew, that is what they would have addressed Jesus as. Yahshua. Yahshua. And I'd heard that many times throughout my life. But I was blessed with an experience recently, and I'll share a, few, a little bit more about that in a few moments. 
And that experience was to go to Israel and to walk the ground that our great Lord walked on. And to be in the place where He made His covenant with Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. To stand in the place where Jesus performed His miracles and He called the disciples. And I really enjoyed this name of Yeshua and it, it is yet to leave my mind. And every time I hear that, I, I have this, an, this intimate image of this loving God who walked around and who ministered and who loved and who spoke truth and life into the darkness. And I address Jesus often as Yeshua because it means something new to me today than it did even just six months ago. Yeshua. Yeshua. The next picture I want to show you, is, or the next slide I want to show you is a picture of me and my father. We look a little bit alike, I believe, and my father was the first person to introduce me to Yeshua. My father was a man of God. He is a retired pastor, and I remember his prayers, always praying. Every time we'd get in the car to go somewhere, I would think, we just want to get there, Dad. Do we really need to pray this time? We'd get there a few minutes earlier if we could just pray maybe before we get in the car or pray last night, but I just remember him being so adamant that Yeshua is so important. We need to invite him everywhere we go. God provided me with a nurturing family, a loving family, and a godly family, and from a young child I remember being induced, introduced to Yeshua. The next picture I want to show you is of me at a camp. I'm standing on the balcony of a lodge that I used to stay in, and I came across this picture. I, I didn't remember uh, seeing it previously. I found it about seven or eight months ago. And as I look at that picture, I can see me as a young boy, this would have been in the early 90s, being so happy to be on this, this piece of the earth. This camp meant so much to me. It was a place that my father took me every summer. I spent 25 summers at this camp, year after year after year, and it was a church camp. And every summer I remember God speaking to me and God calling me and God inviting me to a life of fullness and of hope and of purpose and of light. And I remember God asking me at, these, at this camp regularly to follow Him. I remember invitation after invitation, summer after summer, although we were having lots of fun and swimming and doing all the things that you do at camp, the most profound memories I have of that time at camp were hearing these words from God. Follow me. Follow me. Drop everything. Pick up your cross. Leave your agenda. Forget the world. And follow me. Because nothing else is worth living for. Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am blessed and honored to have, at a young age, heard the Lord speak those words to me. In 1996, my life was changed drastically. In 1996, I was sitting in an airport with my father. This would have been in May. This was the last time I saw my father before he suffered a terrible accident that he did live through, but that changed him forever. I found this picture, and again, I was looking through pictures about seven or eight months ago, and I found this picture. I was just taken back, and I thought, not only do I look clueless there, but I am clueless. I have no idea that my father is going to board a plane and come back a different man. My father went to Brazil on a missions trip. He was on a roof of a building and fell 20 feet on the concrete. And it is a miracle that he survived. The story is miraculous, and I could take up all my time today just telling you that story, and I'm not going to do that. But I just want to highlight that when he came back, it was a miracle that he lived. But there was also a change. A change that no one acknowledged for me. And inside of me there was grief that I had to bury because no one around me was grieving. My father went on the circuit and he was telling the story and doing his testimony and the pastor of our church and the deacons of our church and all my friends and family were just saying, praise God, he is so good, he is so wonderful, and he is. And I thank him for sparing my father's life. But what I didn't know and I know today is that I lost my father. The man who mentored me, the man that I looked up to, the man that was strong and powerful and smart and intellectual, lost his ability to do many of the things that he once did before. He lost what was estimated about 60% of his functioning. He broke his back, had a traumatic brain injury, lost taste and smell, a lot of his memory and many other things. And I lost also my mother because his care was so intensive when he came back that she'd spent most of her time 
caring for him. And I lost parents. They were around, but I was no longer parented. And I began to assume that for me to do life, it was going to have to be on my own. And at a very young age, at my teenage years, at a critical point in my life, I was forced to try and figure life out on my own, or at least I thought I was. That call to follow God began to fade into the background, and I began to follow myself, my own strength, my own energy, my own efforts. And I began to enter, en engineer my own life, my own security, my own future. And I began to depend not on God, but on myself. And this led what to be two decades of fooling myself that I was answering the call to follow him while all along I was following myself. This all, came to, this all came to a point in my life in 2014 where I found myself in the darkest place I'd ever been. After years of half-heartedly following God, and, I, and the good things were happening. I got married. I have three kids. I got a couple degrees. I was always a part of church. I never left God altogether. But inside, I was dying. Inside, I was following him a little less as I got older and began a little more each day, depending upon my own energy. And again, in 2014, I found myself at, at our church. It was in the middle of the day. I had no business being there. I should, have, I should have been at work, but I called in work and said I'm going to be in late. And I just went to the church, and I sat down, and I, I was crying out to God because I, I, was, I was desperate. I was broken. I was lost. I was in despair, and I was in total darkness. And I was in, in the midst of responsibilities that I couldn't keep. I was a father. I was a father of three. I was a husband, and I was in the middle of a job that was highly demanding, and I was actually working at Cornerstone at the time, and people asking me for help with their grief and with their pain and with their sorrow, and I was empty. I was empty. And I, I went to this closet where I knew that we kept Bibles, and I grabbed a pew Bible. And I opened that Bible up to the Gospels, and I thought, I'm going to read it. God is going to speak to me in this moment. He's going to help me because I need his help. And I opened up to the book of Mark. I didn't plan to open up to this book, but I did. I opened up to the book of Mark chapter 2 and I started to read and I came across those words, follow me. And I remember reading those words and I remember thinking, I don't feel anything. I don't hear anything. This might as well be the Sports Illustrated or the newspaper. These words are empty for me. And I remember being so angry at God and almost just in, in anger saying to him, you will speak to me now. You will zap me. You will allow these words to promote transformation in my life and you will remove the darkness and bring about light. Well, he didn't do that. He left me in that darkness, not because he didn't love me, but because I needed to be in the darkness a little longer. And so what did I do? Well, I did what I thought was best and I ripped that page out of the Bible and I put it in my pocket and I said, I will read this continually until you make it mean something to me. Well, weeks and months went by and that piece of paper ended up in my wallet, and I kind of forgot it was there. And I kept running the race, back on the treadmill, in my despair and darkness, hiding from everyone, not admitting to anyone that I was in the place that I was. But deep, enough, but deep below that darkness, there was hope. Looking back on it, I, I can see that, and I can know that. And God was at work. That was in February. I, I even dated that, that piece of paper you see up there, the Bible that I, page that I ripped out. And I've asked forgiveness, by the way, for that. So I think I'm in a good place today. I don't, I don't advise ripping pages out of the Bible. I've never done that before, and I, I won't do it again. But I, was, I needed help. That was in February. In May, I got a call from a friend, and he invited me to go to this place. And I think you all recognize that. That's the Colosseum. And I thought, this is it. God is sending me to Italy to get healed. That's it. I'm going to go to the Colosseum. I'm going to go to the Vatican. I'm going to be on this missions trip to help these churches over there. And I'm going to come back a new man. I'm going to come back and be everything that I know that God wants me to be. I'm going to be the father I should be. I'm going to be the husband I should be. And I'm going to be the world's greatest counselor because he's going to zap me. Well, he actually took me to Italy to show me quite the opposite of what it is to be zapped. He took me to Italy to show me how sick I was. 4,000 miles from home, I remember that I felt just as these words say. 
It is not the healthy people who need a doctor, rather it is the sick people who do. I have come to call those who do not think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. I was lost, I was sick, and I needed a doctor desperately. God had no desire just to zap me. God had the desire to break me. And so 4,000 miles from home, I was in this storefront church, weeping day after day. Weeping. More broken than I'd ever been in my entire life. And it was a beautiful broken. It was a brokenness where my own energy and efforts were useless. I couldn't hold back the tears. I couldn't pretend. And I was 4,000 miles from home, away from everybody that I knew, and away from all the comforts of life, crying to strangers, saying that I am so broken and so far from God, and that I need his help. It was also in this church that he exposed this weakness in my life. No one sews an old patch, sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into an old wineskin. Otherwise the wine will burst and the skins of both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No one, no, they pour new wine into new wineskins. He had showed me that over the past 20 years since my father's life and my self-engineering attempts were useless and that my attempts to put old or new wine into old wineskins just wasn't going to work. I needed a complete transformation. I needed God to not just come in and rearrange a few rooms of my house. I needed Him to tear it down and pour a new foundation and put in the footers and build new frames for the walls. And all of it had to be redone because the old was so insufficient. Because I had built it, not Him. And I found myself in a cabin. About four or five months after Italy, I found myself getting the help that I needed. didn't come directly after Italy. I got a little bit of a burst after Italy, and things were going good for a while, but I again fell flat on my face. And at the end of uh, 2014, I found myself at a retreat center in Ohio. January, the entire month of January of 2015, I spent praying and journaling and soul searching and asking God to transform my life. I admitted to him that I had tried to do life on my own. I admitted to him all of the things that I had done that were outside of his will. And I admitted to him that I was desperate for him and that if I didn't have him and remove all of myself, that I would be without hope, that I would be useless to this world and to my family. And so I I recommitted everything. I I laid it all out for him. Uh, My place of employment was gracious enough to give me that month. And they supported me being there. And I thought, again, just like I thought after Italy, that after a month I would be, I would be good. And after that month, I was in a much better place. But today, even, there is work that is being done. Over two years later, I am still in a process of transformation where God is still bringing light into the dark corners of my life. And I'm thankful for what he exposed in Italy. And I'm thankful for what he exposed in that cabin. And I'm thankful that he is continually bringing light into the darkness of my life and showing me the way and giving me the truth and allowing me to live a life that isn't on my own efforts, but that is on the strength and power of God and the Holy Spirit. And by the saving grace of Jesus, I can remove those things in my life that are so destructive and take away everything beautiful and replace it with things that are full of selfishness and ugliness. Another trip that God provided for me was for me to go to Israel, and I'd already mentioned that, and I did not get there because of anything I deserve or because of anything I did. I didn't even get there because of my own finances. I was gifted the trip to Israel just as I was gifted the trip to Italy. You see me standing on a mountaintop, and that is overlooking the Sea of Galilee. That is called Mount Arbel. That is standing in one of the places that Jesus would have went to pray. I had no business being there. I don't deserve to be there. I did not deserve to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. But he took me there to teach me about redemption. He took me there to expose to me the redemptive work that he had done in my life.
I remember standing on top of that mountain thinking, God, I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. But he loves me. This is the Mount of the Beatitudes. I remember standing there and thinking, I'm restored. You've restored me, Lord. Out of your grace and mercy, you've restored me. And I remember sitting on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and I opened up my Bible, and I began to read and ask God to speak to me. And I didn't intentionally do this, but I opened up my Bible, and I ended up in Mark chapter 2. And I sat on the shore of Capernaum, where Jesus asked Levi to follow him. And as clearly as I've ever heard the Lord speak to me in my life, I heard those words again and they meant something to me. And I forgot that that was in my wallet. It didn't hit me till later that day what I had read and what he had done for me. And I was so excited to get back to the hotel room and to open up my wallet and to see if it truly was. Was it that chapter? Was it that verse? And it was. Over two years after I had read that scripture and it meant nothing, he had taken me to the footsteps of his son, set me on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and showed me the miracle of restoration and redemption that he had done in my life. He restored to me the hope that I had lost along the way. And again, if I can sum those three words up, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I would use the word hope. Rick Warren says that hope lingers in the hearts of every man. Martin Luther King Jr. says that everything that is done in this world is done by hope. If we lose hope, somehow you will lose the vitality that keeps you moving. You lose the courage to be. You lose the courage to move forward and the quality that helps you move on in spite of it all. Two-time cancer survivor Sean Swarner says, you can go a month without food, you can go three days without water, but you can't go more than 60 seconds without hope. No matter what sort of difficulties, how painful experiences are, if you lose hope, that is our real disaster. Bill Hybels. Why is hope so important? Because it protects us from fear and despair. Because it gives us the ability to persevere. It properly arranges our values, our time, and energy. It sustains us. It instills peace and joy. It provides eternal perspective. It allows us to heal from the wounds of pain and grief. It gives life, courage, and strength. It removes excessive anxiety and transcends pain, sadness, and trouble. Why hope? Because without it, we would be consumed with self-enhancement, self-preservation, or greedy control of our lives and others. Jurgen Mottman said, totally without hope, one cannot live. To live without hope is to cease to live. What is hope? Desmond Tutu says that hope is being able to see that there is light despite of the darkness. Emily, Emily Dickerson says, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings a tune without words that never stops at all. Hope itself is like a star not to be seen in the, sh- in the sunshine of prosperity, only to be discovered in the night of adversity. Charles Spurgeon. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. C.S. Lewis. Hope is a portion or part of faith. Faith and hope are overlapping realities. Hope is faith in future tense. So most of faith is hope. It is the feeling of expectation and desire for beauty, light, and love to ascend. It is to cherish the desires of our heart with great anticipation. Lee Strobel says this, Hope is the sense of expectancy and optimism that God wants to instill in all of us 
who love Him and have faith in Him. It is the overriding confidence He gives, reminding us that even in the midst of our greatest problems, God is still with us and He is greater than any challenge we might face. Hope is the inextinguishable flicker God ignites in our souls to keep us believing in the prevailing power of His light even when we are surrounded by utter darkness. It is the unwavering belief that better days are ahead, probably in this world, but most certainly in the, in the next. It is the quiet resolve He hardwires into our spirit that clings to the seemingly impossible truth that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and that in the grand scheme of things we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. It was Paul, that unsinkable carrier of divine hope, who proclaimed, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demon, nor any power, neither present nor future, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That, my friends, is the great reason for hope, a truth that we need to let sink into the very being of our, of our, of our being. Because we live in a culture that seems to be bent on spreading with evangelistic zeal a relentless message of hopelessness. Maybe that message is getting the best of you today. Maybe you feel uncertain about your future or your life. Maybe a sense of guilt or regret weighs you down from your past. Maybe the reality of the problems of this life and the pain of this life are never far away. It could be that hopelessness has burdened you far too long. It is important to remember what Jesus said, that in this world we will have trouble, but he, were, he proclaimed boldly just after that to take heart that he has overcome the world. We must, with God's help, learn to cling to that rare and wonderful thing that otherwise called hope, that otherwise we are destined for despair. To be clear, hope is not wishful thinking or blind optimism. It is rooted, that is rooted in uncertainty. There is a distinct difference between the certainty that we have in God and the uncertainty that we have in our lives in this world. Pure hope and true hope is, the, is to expect with confidence and certainty. The kind of hope that God provides is the kind of hope that can transform a human life. It is the kind of hope that can redeem and restore someone from total darkness. It is the kind of hope that Jesus came to this earth for. The hope that he lived, died, and resurrected for. The kind of hope that God put in each of you to yearn for. The kind of hope we yearn for if we are without. How do we get hope? We simply get hope by trusting the words of Jesus, the words of God. We believe and we trust and we have faith in the God who will produce a beautiful and preferred and promised future. Knowing the promises of God, including, including heaven, the place prepared for us and our loved ones. Knowing the God who is and was and is to come. Knowing the maker and creator of all that is or ever will be. Depending on the presence of our heavenly Father who is eternally faithful. Make no mistake about it, if we put our hope in something we can lose, we will lose hope. Misguided or misplaced in hope in something or someone will disappoint. We were created with the desire for hope. We were created for certainty in God's hope, in His provision, and in His promises. John Calvin said we should ask God to increase our hope when it is small, awaken it when it is dormant, confirm it when it is wavering, strengthen it when it is weak, and raise it up when it is overthrown. Martin Luther King Jr. said we must accept finite pain, but never lose hope. Nelson Mandela, may your choices reflect your hope, not your fears. Sean Khan, walk with hope, and you will never walk alone. So let's look away from the circumstances that confront us. Let's look away from our own ability and look to the God who is infinitely powerful and loving and full of grace and mercy. May we look to the promises of Christ. May we depend upon His provision and His love for us. May we trust in the wonderful I Am statements that we hear again and again throughout the Gospels. May we trust the words that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are honored to be in Your presence today. God, we are honored that You love us. 
God, I am so humbled that I have a story to share and that I have the hope of the Lord living inside of me because I don't deserve it. Your grace and your mercy are a gift freely given to us to a person who doesn't deserve it. But as Attila said earlier today, your unmerited favor finds each of us in the midst of humility and brokenness. Father, position us to hear from you. May we meet with you face to face. May we know without a doubt that we have encountered the Lord Almighty. And Lord, may we all have a story to share of the amazing ability for the I am, the way, the truth, and the life to restore and to redeem. And God, we claim your promises. We claim your authority over any darkness that may be represented in this room today. Any pain, any struggle, any addiction, any affliction, anything that is represented in this room, Lord, that is a darkness in someone's life, we claim by the power and the blood and the authority of Jesus right now that you began to wash over them and that the amazing hope of our Lord Jesus rises up in every heart and in every soul in this room and that we lift a word of praise to you, Lord, that brings a smile to your face. God, we are desperate for you. We praise you. We love you. We pray all of this in the strong name of our son Jesus, or your son Jesus. Amen. (laughs) Don't you just love it when God shows up and shows off? (laughs) <laughs> wow. I mean, I could have listened to you another hour uh, or more. That was wonderful. And you know what? As I was hearing you share your testimony, I thought, we're going to have to have him come back. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have us some church meetings all week long. Uh, this was amazing. And you know what, what really blessed me so much as you were uh, bringing the whole story together about um, the redemption part and restore, restoration part that God went to the extreme to get you a free trip to Israel to take you to the place where Jesus spoke those words. Now, that's amazing. That is just absolutely amazing. I want you to know God showed up here today, and he showed off. Let's pray for Ty. Lord God, we just thank you for his heart and the wonderful thing that you have done for him. I pray that you bless his wife, his children. We pray for him to have a safe trip back, and Lord, we do. We do want him to come back and share the word of God with us, and we thank you for it already in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't want to go home. (laughs) This is great. This is great. All right. Well, let's stand and sing our closing hymn today, which is... Uh, Number 321, When We Walk with the Lord.
share the benediction with you, um, but I want you to know that Ty is going to be in the back. You can greet him as you uh, leave the sanctuary today. And again, let's give him a hand. Thank you for uh, sharing the word with us. In 2 Timothy 2, it says, the saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Go in peace and God bless you. Thank you.